Hello, I'm Britton Clenet and welcome to China Insight, where we discuss the latest issues affecting this rapidly changing country. Well, the catalyst for that change has, of course, been the country's expanding economy, which since the 1970s has lifted 800 million people out of poverty. But the benefits have been felt mostly in the cities. There are still more than 55 million people living below the poverty line in China today, and most of them live in the countryside. Well, to find out more about China's wealth gap and how to combat rural poverty. I'm joined by Tang Min, the councillor of China State Council. Welcome to the program. Welcome. Well, I just mentioned that 800 million, you know, figure, but still, you know, there are something like 1% of China's population own a third of China's wealth. How did this wealth gap problem come to exist in the first place? Okay. Now, first of all, I have to explain a little bit about what the poverty, uh, poverty line is. So. How do we measure the 800, peop- 800 million people out of poverty? Mm-hmm. Usually use a World Bank standard called a per dollar per day. So the person is earning one dollar a day, and that person is, means out of poverty. But per dollar per day later, because the inflation is now maybe $1.5 dollar or something. Mm-hmm. Now China, is this 800 million dollar, uh, people is a bil- before the below one dollar per day. Right. Now and that's above. the poverty line. Yeah, the poverty and the above. Right. Now, okay, give a number. 1978, when China started reform, on average, whole countries per person a year GDP than $200. Hmm. The whole country. Okay, now it's a eight. Eight million, uh, uh, eight thousand dollars, in income increase of forty times. Mm. So for those people, before very poor, now the, their income also increased. So right. The above per dollar per day, so the out of poverty. But from two hundred dollars to per capita to eight thousand dollars, large proportion of this this increase come to this one percent. The people, mm-hmm. the wealthy people. So they getting one percent people getting thirty percent of the total country wealth. Mm. However, these eight hundred million people, they their income increase, but not as much as this one. So income gap become bigger, bigger. But in the meantime, those people out of poverty, not mm-hmm. contradiction. Why is it so important that the government focuses on improving the livelihoods of people in the countryside? Yeah, because. Uh, almost 100% of the poverty all concentrated in rural area. Mm. That's number one. That's an important point. Yeah, yeah. but only even 100% poverty you still have a low income people in the rural area also. Mm-hmm. And all around the world, the rural and, and urban, there are gap. But usually two to one. Like uh, urban earn two dollars, rural earn one dollar. Mm-hmm. So there are always a gap. Okay. But in China, so three to four to one. Hmm. So the gap, rural and urban, much bigger co- compared with the other countries. Mm-hmm. That means uh, need help. That's why government the policy is all concentrated in the rural area and help them for the uh, social welfare system. They are, say for example, they are the, the, the uh, old age, they're mm-hmm. getting support, medical, uh, education, and all we have to, in future, have to put them in that area. And of course, boost the local economy by helping local businesses in the countryside. China Insight took a closer look at one government initiative aiming to improve the quality of life for farmers in Sichuan. Here's the report. It's late 2015, and amongst the mango trees on a hillside in Sichuan province, the people of Tungba village in Tan have gathered to hear a story. It's about a farmer, a failing business, and how he turned it around. This is Xiongguan Cheng. Back in 2011, the 50-acre mango orchard he'd planted five years earlier remained largely barren. But with the help of science, his trees and his business are now bearing fruit. Mm. 
Xiong couldn't understand why his mango trees refused to blossom or bear fruit. The leaves were, for the most part, all that was growing. With no other source of income, his family faced financial ruin. Boomtown. It's a term that can be used to describe Panjurhua, which has been a mining-driven powerhouse since the 1960s. Today, it's ranked among the most prosperous cities in Sichuan province. But the gap between the haves and the have-nots is wide, and there are more than 26,000 mainly rural residents, which accounts for about 2% of the population, that are still living in poverty. In Futian town, a Yi ethnic minority community, about 100 of the 4,000 residents are living below the poverty line. A few years ago, town officials decided that mangoes, a high-value crop, would help the financial situation of the local subsistence corn and sweet potato farmers. But the early results weren't promising. Then, in 2011, a team of fruit tree experts from the Panjuhua Agriculture and Forestry Science Research Institute paid the village a visit as part of a poverty alleviation program. For Xiong Guancheng, it was a watershed moment. Mm. Li Gui Li is a fruit cultivation expert from the Panjurhua Agriculture and Forestry Science Research Institute. In 2011, the Panjurhua Ethnic and Religious Affairs Committee Agriculture and Forestry Science Research Institute and Renhu Futian Town established a three-way partnership to guide the mango science and technology to combat poverty. Today, the Mango Planting Guidance Program in Futian has been expanded throughout the region for struggling farmers living just above or even below the poverty line. It's a ray of hope and a chance to turn their flagging orchards into viable businesses providing them with a decent livelihood. Young Winjun is one of the main players dropped. She concedes that previous education programs failed to yield meaningful results. In view of past failings, the new project, launched in 2011, was designed to provide training and guidance over a three-year period. A phased training model was adopted, with experts stepping in to teach and guide the farmers at key points throughout the process of planting and growing mango trees. Under the three-way partnership, the Panjuhua Ethnic and Religious Affairs Committee was responsible for fundraising. The Agriculture and Forestry Science Research Institute took charge of technical guidance, and the Futian local government ensured that farmers attended training. Yang Wenjun, having realised that the previous approach needed a shake-up, came up with the idea of selecting a number of farmers in each village to be given intensive training. They could then become de facto trainers. The, the problem was deciding which farms and farmers to choose for the intensive one-on-one -on -one training and guidance from experts. A clear risk of poverty, an appropriate scale of production, access to infrastructure like roads and a good water source were identified as the basic but the deal breaker was finding farmers who would be willing to teach others. Many of the recommended households and farms fell short of the program's standards. Tong Zhu, the senior agronomist of the Panjurhua Agriculture and Forestry Science Research Institute, was given the task of finding candidates.
and she wasn't shy about rejecting those who were unsuitable. At this meeting in Jingwei, she dismisses several suggestions from community leaders, telling the villagers to choose a short list of candidates from amongst themselves. Guided by the experts, the villagers chose their model farmers. Xiongguan Cheng was among the first batch of 20 to undergo training. To help the farms improve mango growing as quickly as possible, the Agriculture and Forestry Science Research Institute formed a crack team of experts led by Li Guili. Du Bang is a fruit tree breeding expert who is working with Xiong Guan Cheng. He often visits Xiong's orchard to give him hands on training. Shuguan 以前不了解情况下,今天我们讲起了才发现,他要之前还是要有关比例的空间,他也有阳光门,人会有龙座,我知我都离不开这个阳光,他也偏光和作用,他在促进更新发,牺牲。The training program is now bearing fruit, as are the trees. Xiongguan Changs are finally beginning to blossom in significant numbers. After a series of poor harvests, he finally made his first profit in 2014, based on a bumper harvest worth around 12,000 US dollars. Funding for this poverty alleviation program is limited, just under 16,000 US dollars a year over the past five years. The challenge is to ensure that this small amount of money has a big and lasting impact. After three years, with 20 trainees from the region around Futian making a profit, the decision was made to send the successfully trained farmers out to educate their peers on how to use scientific methods to increase mango production. The experts train a small number of farmers, and those farmers train their peers. In this way, word of the program and its results spread. But with a finite number of experts monitoring an ever-increasing number of farmers, how is it possible to judge the scheme's effectiveness in practice? For the experts, the biggest challenge is not the one-on-one -on -one training, but the strict supervision required afterwards. They must watch over the trainee farmers, who in turn must keep an eye on their own trainees. Tong Zhu is inspecting one of the farms to make sure standards are being maintained. In just a few years, the program has trained 38 farmers in Futian alone, and these farmers have in turn trained another 278. But with more than 1,000 mango plantations in the region, many of them struggling to break even, the poverty alleviation program still has a long way to go. When the program kicked off in Futian back in June 2011, only a few farmers were willing to participate. Four years on, there are more than 300 trainees. In Futian and in the nearby villages, for many households, mango growing is now their main source of income. I'm <laughs> <laughs>
这个，这个也是，这个是。<笑>都是芒果大锅，都是二十八万，没得我这卖十多万那点。下面的要上来上课了。Futian's successful poverty alleviation program based on mangoes has now been copied and adapted to walnut planting in four other towns and villages in Panjuhua. The example set by early adopters like Xiong Guan Cheng is slowly spreading. He says his mango harvest has increased every year since he began receiving expert guidance. His income in 2014, 12,000 US dollars, virtually doubled to about 23,000 US dollars the following year. It's still early days, but in Panjuhua, science is creating a future in which poverty is a thing of the past. What's your take on this initiative? It's very interesting. Actually, this is a very, uh, a, a very similar problem in many, many rural areas. You can see that uh, actually the Chinese rural area, they do have a productions. They can grow mango, they can do other things. But because they lack of a technology, mm. so that's why they, they put the money, invest money, but they're not getting the result. So they need a technician coming in, right? The other problem is, if everybody grow mango here, they cannot sell, and because the local market is too small, right. and nobody, everybody take a mango. Right. So well, they have to you say, yeah, maybe in the local market, but yeah, exactly. Yeah, so distribu distribution channels need to be. But not only advanced. distribution market. Also, if you do the, the regular traditional distribution market, mm -hmm. and again they layer so many, and they do not getting much money there. That the uh, 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 purchase price very low, and mm -hmm. sell to urban area, your wholesale and sh shipping everything. So, Come to urban is very expensive already, and right. the farmers do not get any benefit for that. Mm. So now we'll, we will use the e-commerce, mm. and the farmer directly sell to the urban, and people buy from the internet. Right. So then they get rid of uh, so many middlemen. Mm -hmm. So this is a uh, two new development in China rural area. One is technology; you can bring the new, uh, new product, more production. Secondly, use the uh, e-commerce and to help them directly sell to the urban citizens and then they increase the rural income. So how do you get um, you know, China, Chinese farmers to you know, learn about e-commerce and, and train them up? I guess you need to send people there to train them. That's right. But even that training, you can see the technicians doing the training. They still use a traditional way to training. Mm -hmm. So that's why a few technicians can only help a few villages mm. for many years. There are still thousands of thousand villages that need the help, but it seems they have a lack of a, uh, human resource. Mm. So they, for many years, did not get the help. Right? And why not use the internet based the technology? Mm. And you record the air, the tech, use the internet, use the uh, videos to send to the other villages. Other villages, people can, 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 can follow that and also can do their own. Uh, 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 learning the technology. And so, the local government then could get involved by, by showing these videos, and right. providing the channel for them to, to watch right. these videos and learn. That's right, that's right. So that means the rural China, if we're really out of poverty, a lot of new thing can do. And in your view, is it, you know, is it a matter of, a, of kind of employing this, this local solution or should it be something that the central government kind of gets hold of? That's right. Central government and the local government can and work both. together, it's a combination. Yeah, they can work together. And not only that, also um, the social, uh, the, the civil, service, uh, uh, civil societies are also involved. We are, uh, be, belong to the foundation, mm. we help them. And also many enterprise, mm. many volunteers, and they want to help. So with the, all the society working together, and because we, uh, government set a target by 2020, mm -hmm. still three, a little more than three years from now, and all those 55 million people should be out of poverty. So this is still a very tough uh, job. Well, that's it. There's a, there's a big, big task ahead. But I just wonder whether you know this is the best way forward. Whether programs like this are very are the most effective way of alleviating poverty. And this is one of them. 
Okay. Because as, as I said, for those have a product, have a labors, can doing that things. And for some of the pro uh, problem is they're so removed, high, very high mountain area. Mm. It's very expensive. You build the roads to there, you build right. everything's too expensive. So we have to remove those people down to the, uh, the, the, the other area. Mm. We call it relocation. Relocation those people. They, are, they count around 10 million people. You're saying 10, 10 million people need to be relocated? Relocated. Because they live somewhere to, where it's too remote. Yeah, too remote area and those areas, some of the earthquakes or, or very difficult to build a road. It's too mm. expensive to there. So in your so view, remove that down. to get these 55 million people out of poverty, it's a combination of relocation, uh, more welfare and programs and like this. And program like this uh, and uh, e-commerce combined with technology mm. helping. Um, so these are the, all the combinations. For each different group of people, they're getting a, a different kind of help. So now we call this a targeted the poverty uh, program. Mm -hmm. And Jing Jun Fu Ping in Chinese, we target the program for each family, poverty family, we have to identify what's the problem, why they are poor, and how can help them for each people that have a different uh, way to help them. This which is China's urbanization and I just wonder whether you think that something like this um, could you know make it more attractive for uh, rural dwellers to stay in the countryside rather than being attracted to moving to cities. Yeah and you, if you do analyze these 800 million people out of poverty you find the majority of people out of poverty because their family have one person or two person is moved to the urban area and they get an income there and they can help the family and so on and so forth. And welfare yeah. benefits. Urbanization is one of the most important reason to reduce poverty in China, particularly for rural poverty. It's a very good point. Yeah. yeah. But you cannot move all the people to the urban area because Chinese rural area still like 600 million to 500 to 600 million people. There's a lot of people that still there, and mm -hmm. they still need the, uh, uh, quite a long time. The urbanization is a, a gradual uh, uh, process, so this is the rural area. So for those that remain the rural area, you have to use the other way to do that. But their, their next generation, their kids, it's possible to give a good education, they can move to urban area. Mm -hmm. Urban still need the laborers. So no, another very important uh, program to help the poverty is improve the quality of education in rural area. Yes. And not only for the uh, basic education, also for these uh, vocational trainings. Mm -hmm. And if they get getting skilled, mm -hmm. they're easy to find a job in right. the urban area. Which would then also expand the middle class. That's right. That's okay. right. All right. Well, I want to continue this very interesting discussion mm -hmm. after a short break when we come back more on rural poverty and China's wealth gap. Stay with us. Welcome back. I've been talking about China's wealth gap and rural poverty with Tan Min, the councillor of China State Council. Well, we asked several people in Beijing for their thoughts on China's rural poor. Let's have a look. 在我看来的话，农村的比较落后的地方应该是一些文化卫生或者说是思想观念方面比较落后。土地就是同样的土地，获取财富的这个比例也是不一样的。比方说。我觉得这个可能是造成这个社会的便宜吧我觉得主要是信息方面的吧就是比如说不管是他们想致富好但是他们缺乏相关的比如说怎么去创业致富啊怎么去经商致富啊他们缺乏这方面的信息然后也因为
困难，就需要长期的去投入。呃，我觉得呢，就是农村只要是在交通啊、医疗、学校，还有各方面的卫生条件下，都比较落后的。我老家其实就是农村的，其实我回去我。现在现在农村已经有了一个很大的改善，但是相比城市还有一个很大的一个匮乏以及它的一个潜力。我希望就是医疗医疗方面可以采用更更多更好的一些器材，或者或者科技下乡呀等等一些方式，呃，去扶持农村。Science and technology, that's something that you raise as an, an important way of eradicating poverty and improving the livelihoods of people in the countryside. Can China really reach this goal of 20, in 2020 eradicating poverty? What do you think? They have to do, because the government already set their target, and uh, the whole society make all the effort to make it. And it's possible, um, because uh, with such an input, with the subject of a big resource moving to the uh, poverty area, it's possible can achieve that. Right? And to reduce the poverty, there were, there were two parts. One is what market can do, use the market mechanism. Mm -hmm. Another one is social welfare system. Right. And, and both governments have to play some roles. Mm. For example, use the market run, government may have to provide the roles and uh, the uh, electricity right. and all the basic infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? Then maybe provide some technology transfers and the technology uh, trainings to them and let them take an advantage like uh, these mango trees uh, uh, planner and they can uh, uh, improve technology, they can mm -hmm. sell to the market. Right? But for the people that, can't, that don't have this mango farm or something like it, welfare is also important. So the two need to work in tandem. Right. For those who are too old or they are uh, handicapped, for example, mm -hmm. and they cannot do that. So this time, and you have to have what? First, you have the very good uh, uh, medical care system, mm -hmm. right? The rural medical care system is still very poor. Government have to have an input to there. Yeah. And the other one is the, the it's not a pension, but the sort of pension for those people already old, and you have to building a uh, good facilities for them to, to live in there and provide some uh, assistance to there. And China now already have what we call the minimum living standard uh, supporting system. If your income below this amount, government will pay you. It's now already have a like a 40 to 50 million people mm. every month receive this uh, minimum living standard support. Right. But so far, th th this support the standard too low and gradually have to moving up. So with this, all the systems, and hopefully by end of 2020, and this are uh, all the 50 million, we call the absolute poverty is way out. But we still have a poverty, even after 2020, we still have poverty, mm. but this poverty is a relative poverty. And like the United States, any developed country, they still have some poor. Mm -hmm. But this poor is not like they do not have enough food, or do not have clothing. Right. They are relatively poor. Mm. And in future, we have a constant, we have a more concentrated relative poor. Thank you very much for coming on the program for your insight today. It was a very nice discussion. You're welcome. If you have any comments or questions, please email us at chinainsight at cctv.com or you can find us on Facebook, Weibo and WeChat. And we'll see you next time for more stories and discussion on China, out of China. Goodbye.